we are less than one month out from the midterm elections, and we're about to see a wave of debates in crucial races as candidates are scrambling to get their message to voters. The competitive fight for Ohio's Senate seat is no exception to this. Just two days before early voting began in the Buckeye State, the Republican nominee, J.D. Vance, and the Democratic nominee, Congressman Tim Ryan, faced off in their first debate. Before we dive in, I want to give you some context. Despite J.D. Vance's unrestrained criticism of the former president in the past, he welcomed Donald Trump's endorsement earlier this cycle. And he continued to do so even after this happened. The New York Times did a fake story today, big front page, that J.D. wasn't sure if he wanted my support. J.D. is kissing my ass. He wants my support. So I'm 18 points up. So back to the debate. On the debate stage, Congressman Ryan, well, he made sure Ohio voters, they didn't forget that. Take a listen. After Trump took J.D. Vance's dignity from him on the stage in Youngstown, J.D. Vance got back up on stage and said, start shaking his hand, take a picture, saying, hey, aren't we having a great time here tonight? I don't know anybody I grew up with, I don't know anybody I went to high school with that would allow somebody to take their dignity like that and then get back up on stage. We need leaders who have courage to take on their own party. And I've proven that. And he was called an ass kisser by the former president. That was just one of a few notable moments that we're going to get into with our political panel. So let's bring them in. Joining me now is Atima Omar. She is a Democratic strategist and president of the Omar Strategy Group. And former Republican Congressman Carlos Carbello of Florida is with us. He is an MSNBC political analyst as well. Welcome, welcome to you both. Atima, I want to start with you. Uh, obviously, in that clip, uh, Ryan was calling out J.D. Vance's subservience to Trump. He also repeatedly throughout the debate pointed to times that he himself has disagreed with Democratic leadership. He even said that he wants someone other than President Biden to run in 2024 on the Democratic ticket. How do you think Tim Ryan's performance in this particular debate is going to appeal to Ohio voters? I think that Tim Ryan has always had a good sense that some of the Ohio voters that he's appealing to are folks who have voted for Republicans in the past. So there's a base of Democratic support there, and he knows it, it's pretty good that should he cater to it, that there is a good swath of folks who voted for Republican and Democrats in the past. And so he's trying to say, I can be independent on some issues within the Democratic Party, although I am a Democrat. And that's what he's trying to strike the balance on, I think, as a, as a strategy, um, compared to Sherrod Brown, who is very unabashedly Democrat, um, but, you know, manages to appeal to Ohio voters as well. So we'll see if the strategy works. We'll see how it's working out. Uh, in that debate, another notable point for me was um, that J.D. Vance say that he believes in, quote, reasonable exceptions when it comes to abortion. And he was citing this very disturbing case that we have all talked about of a 10-year-old girl in Ohio, remember, who was raped and then she had to travel out of state for an abortion due to the state's six-week abortion ban that was in effect at that time. I want to play for you guys right now what exactly J.D. Vance said on the debate stage. I have said repeatedly on the record that I think that that girl should be able to get an abortion if she and her family so choose to do so. Now, the campaign that J.D. Vance has been running has been anything but moderate. He at once said that he was 100 percent pro-life, and that was his uh, abortion policy. But in this clip, he seems to distance himself from this harder right-wing policy in this debate. Congressman, what do you think voters are going to make of this apparent shift, or do you think they'll see it as a shift at all? Well, Simone, I don't know the details of J.D. Vance's position on abortion weeks ago, but I can tell you that the entire Republican Party is running away from the abortion issue. They perceive political peril there. They know that uh, a majority of Americans don't support the court's decision reversing Roe, so they don't want to talk about the issue. And if they have to talk about it, they're going to talk about it defensively. I think that's what came across in J.D. Vance's response, whereas before, Democrats were the ones who were on defense on abortion trying to defend, for example, partial birth abortion. Now Republicans are the ones who are on defense, given that the law has changed, talking about how they would allow certain kinds of abortions. 
It's amazing uh, how uh, people move when it's time to talk about real life implications. Again, I've said for a while that a number of my Republican friends, congressmen, they were not running on jailing women, you know, making 10 year olds have babies by their rapists, jailing or finding doctors. But the result of the Dobbs decision and these policies in states across the country, that's exactly what's happening in some places. That's right. Uh, I mean, this issue has completely flipped. Before, it was Republicans who were on offense trying to get Democrats to back away from uh, what they perceived were extremist positions. Now, it's the complete opposite. You have Republicans having to say, no, 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 we are for uh, certain exceptions, and Democrats uh, are really on offense on the issue. And this is the one issue that's really gotten in the way of Republican plans to highlight inflation, the economy, crime, immigration, the issues they know they need if they're going to carry the day on the 8th of November. Mm. Well, let's move to Pennsylvania, where this is one of the Senate races between Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman and Republican Mehmet Oz. This race has tightened in recent days. It's very interesting. The Philadelphia Inquirer, they recently asked a number of undecided voters why they have yet to make up their minds. And the answers... One voter said that she aligned with the right more on family values, but felt, quote, in between on social issues. Uh, another said that uh, John Fetterman seems too liberal, but that Oz isn't a, quote, true Pennsylvanian. And an independent voter who switched from Republican during the Trump administration said that if Oz is sanctioned by Trump, he could forget it. So, Atima, a, a lot of these folks, um, as you see, a varying of answers. A lot of these people were typically, typically Republican voters. And although they're not supporting Oz, it is very clear from the Philadelphia Inquirer's reporting that they're not entirely sold on John Fetterman. So, what can the Fetterman campaign do to bring them into the fold? I think a lot of what they're already doing now is successfully, clearly, the messaging around Mehmet Oz being um, from New Jersey and not Pennsylvania, compared to Fetterman, who's been at local office, currently lieutenant governor, you know, homegrown candidate, um, is landing quite well, especially with the swath of Pennsylvanians in between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, which are more transient cities. So I think continuing to hone that in. Also, abortion is playing a big role um, in votes for in Pennsylvania as well. That's why uh, Josh Shapiro is competitive as a gubernatorial candidate. You've got about 43 percent of Pennsylvania independent voters saying abortion should be legal in all cases. Obviously, that's close to over 90 percent with the Democratic base. And, and, you know, in most average polling, about two out of five Republicans also think so as well, uh, support that abortion should be legal in all cases. So I think between, you know, those couple of things, as well as talking about the economy and sort of his record as lieutenant governor and mayor and his experience in, in working on economic issues, I think will continue. It'll be a close race, but I think will help him um, get to the finish line. It is definitely one of the races to watch. Pennsylvania, obviously, key state in 2022, was a key state in 2020 and will be key in 2024. Another state that falls in that category, I think it's safe to say, is Arizona. Let's talk a little Arizona. AZ Central noted that in a recent Trump rally in Mesa, Arizona, Republican candidates backed away from their previous lies that the 2020 election was stolen. That includes the far-right election denier Carrie Lake, who is running for governor, and didn't mention the 2020 election once in her 18-minute speech. You know, Congressman, Carrie Lake is virtually tied with the Democratic candidate in this race, Katie Hobbs, in the polls. And that's according to 538. Do you think that keeping her election denial quiet even though, let's just be clear, that <laughs> she questioned the validity of her own election in the primary, of which she ended up winning. Uh, but do you think that undecided voters will be reassured by this in Arizona? No, Simone. This is the trap that Republicans have made for themselves. Before the 6th of January of 2021, a lot of Republicans thought having Trump behind you was good in general elections. And in some states, it did work out that way. But after the 6th of January, we live in a different world. And most voters in the country, let's call it two-thirds, find what Donald Trump did reprehensible. They know he's been lying about the election. And that's why, for these candidates, once they make it to the general election, they try to hit reverse. And it's very difficult. And it makes you lose credibility with both sides. So it's really a trap that a lot of these Republicans have set up for themselves. You heard Mitch McConnell talk about candidate quality and the party struggles with candidate quality. That's what he's referring to, candidates who have embraced lies in the primary, who have 
uh, put on the Trump uniform, and then all of a sudden they get to the general election and they realize it's a drag. They try to shed all of that, but it's very mm -hmm. difficult, and it does make you less credible with voters. People just end up d realizing that they can't trust you. I mean, I, I just, I have been saying the voters are not stupid. And you just, some, some of the positions that folks are taking that are a complete about face from what they said just a couple months ago, I just think it's so disingenuous and disrespectful to voters. In, in New Hampshire. You, yeah. In New yeah, Hampshire, in New there's Hampshire. a dramatic example of that. <laughs> Yeah. It's insane. And in a state like Arizona that had recounted themselves, they were at the center of the recounting fight, and they have been through this, and they've had their elections recertified how many times after the 2020 election? So it's more keenly on their minds than it would be in a state where the recount, you know, didn't happen a number of times Exactly. Already. I think that's such an important point, Atima. You know, um, recently, there is a, a, there are a couple, a handful of Republicans out there, current sitting senators who are not running for re-election or, or lost, and some of them have decided to weigh in for d Democrats in these upcoming general elections. Adam Kinzinger, Congress Congressman is one of those folks. He endorsed a wave of Democrats in competitive races, including Katie Hobbs. Uh, we, we were just talking about uh, when also Secretary of State in Michigan, uh, Jocelyn Benson, Democrat Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. Atima, do you think that Adam Kinzinger's endorsement is this a helpful endorsement, or will it matter for Democrats? I think it's a helpful endorsement to those Republicans who are also bothered by one six, and and those folks are in Pennsylvania, um, as sort of cited from uh, you know articles before, uh, and they are in Arizona and they are in Michigan. So he's, he's specifically targeting states where they're much more in tune and feeling sensitive around one six and the recount and what happens to their elected officials. To, you know, forcibly overturn the election um, due but to do Trump's you, efforts. Do you think it's enough yeah. to move a race, Atima? You know, like Adam Kinzinger, yeah. is he, he's not necessarily a household name, but do you think it's a, enough to pick off a number of voters to make a difference in uh, the Senate race in Pennsylvania or the Senate race in, or even the governor's race in Arizona? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I think that uh, I really think it might help with some Republican voters at 1-6 was a deal breaker. I remember reading that from one of the articles. There's a few of those who had that and were like, OK, you know, after they switched after 1-6. But if they already switched after 1-6, like their mind is already made up. So I don't know that it swings, but it's, it's a nice addition. It's a nice addition. <laughs> Atima Amar, Carlos Carbello, thank you both for this rousing conversation. Less than 30 days out from Election Day, we will be back.